Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson, and I'm here to show you what remains of the Church of St. Polyuctus in Istanbul. You may not be familiar with St. Polyuctus, and as you can see, the church no longer stands. But stick around, because this building was one of the most influential and beautiful in Byzantine history. Polyuctus was a Roman soldier, martyred for his Christian faith in the 250s AD. When miracles were reported by those who remembered him, his journey to sainthood had begun. Polyuctus was killed on the Armenian frontier, but his cult spread, and a church was built for him at Constantinople by Elia Evthokia, the wife of Emperor Theodosius II. That church was knocked down and rebuilt by her great-granddaughter, Anitia Juliana, in the 520s, and it is this rebuilt church whose ruins you can now see in Istanbul. Anitia Juliana was a woman of impeccable pedigree. Not only could she trace her lineage through the Theodosian dynasty, but beyond that to Constantine himself. Her father had been Western Roman Emperor, and both her husband and son were prime candidates to ascend to the throne in Constantinople. We can only imagine her disgust when both were passed over in favour of a low-born soldier named Justin, who became emperor in 518 AD. Worse still, Justin was grooming his equally low-born nephew Justinian to succeed him, a man who'd married a former prostitute. To give you an idea of Anitia's social status, you should know that she personally corresponded with the Pope during this period. She was also a great patron of the arts, using her wealth to build churches and produce fine pieces of art, like this illustrated manuscript, with an image of Anitia on the cover. She's in the center. Now in her 60s, Anitia Juliana decided to rebuild the family church dedicated to St. Polyuctus in grand style. Modeling the new foundation on the biblical description of Solomon's temple, Anitia aimed to leave a statement in stone about her family's lineage and piety. The results were spectacular. The church she erected was possibly the largest in the city, and certainly the most richly decorated. Only a woman with imperial levels of wealth could have afforded such a structure, and the artisanal skill on display was outstanding. Whether Anitia meant the building to be a jab at the low-born dynasty now ensconced in the palace, we can't be sure. But they certainly took it that way. St. Polyuctus was built between 524 and 527 AD, and shortly afterwards Justinian completed a church of his own dedicated to a pair of fellow military saints, Sergius and Bacchus. The building still stands, as does this inscription, which wraps around the building. Incredibly, Justinian uses a religious foundation to score points off his rival. The inscription begins, Other sovereigns have honoured dead men whose labour was unprofitable. A clear attack on the cult of Polyuctus and the woman who had just honoured him in such lavish fashion. Anitia died a year after her church was complete, and a decade later, Justinian finished the Hagia Sophia, which would forever put St. Polyuctus in the shade. But no doubt his desire to create such a colossal cathedral was partly inspired by the impact her church had made. We know that St. Polyuctus remained a prominent church in Constantinople for centuries, and that its beautiful decoration was a prime target for the Crusaders when they looted the city in 1204. But that's about all we knew until 1960, when construction began on a new intersection in the centre of Istanbul. Pieces of St. Polyuctus's decoration were found and identified by this inscription, which had been written down in a collection of epigrams during Byzantine times. The subsequent archaeological study informs us that the church's main entrance stopped being used at some point in the 10th century, and the site became first a squat and then later a graveyard. 
The building's substructure was then sealed up to become a cistern in the 12th century, and finally the church itself collapsed at some point in the decades before 1204. The Byzantines themselves had already begun to loot the site for building material before the Crusaders arrived to carry off their own trophies. All that remains on site today are the building's substructures. These pillars next to the arch are where the wall was blocked off when these lower areas were converted into a cistern. The church floor was five metres above the ground. This allowed room for a crypt to be installed to house Polyuctus's relics. It also created the need for a large staircase leading to the church doors, possibly in imitation of the entrance to Solomon's temple. Allusions to the great biblical temple were well known in Byzantium, and archaeologists found that Anitia had laid out her church to the same dimensions as Solomon's foundation, even using the ancient measurement of the cubit to create a nave that was 52 metres square, huge by contemporary standards. Inside, the church had two levels of colonnades, creating a gallery above. Reconstructions suggest that Justinian's church of Achia Irene may be a good, rough comparison for its layout. Debate continues about whether the building actually had a dome. The beautiful reconstructions I've shown you, based on the work of Martin Harrison, are visually pleasing. But this theoretical plan by Jonathan Bardil is a persuasive counter-argument. This gives the church a traditional basilical roof. The reason the debate receives so much attention is the rivalry between Justinian and Anitia. If she introduced the first church dome in the capital city, then Justinian's work becomes a replica and improvement on her idea, whereas if it was he who first introduced the dome, then he will gobble up even more credit for this hugely influential innovation. The comparison with Solomon's temple is made explicit in Anitia's inscription, where she also name-checks her impressive family tree. What choir is sufficient to sing the contests of Juliana, who, after Constantine, embellisher of his Rome, after the holy all-golden light of Theodosius, and after royal descent from so many forebears, accomplished a work worthy of her family, and more than worthy, in a few years. She alone has overpowered time and surpassed the wisdom of the celebrated Solomon, raising a temple to receive God, the richly wrought and gracious splendor of which a great epoch cannot celebrate. This modest epigram stretches to 76 lines, encircling the entire nave and then spilling out into the narthex and the church courtyard. It's the decoration surrounding this inscription which has drawn most attention from historians. These relief carvings are of astounding quality, down to showcasing the veins of individual leaves. These grapevines ran the entire length of the nave and each niche below them had a peacock in a different pose. At the time, these marble blocks would have been painted in bright colours and inlaid with coloured glass. Holding the galleries aloft were a series of columns with these elaborately carved capitals, which made a big impression on contemporaries and were imitated in Justinian's buildings. The cost of this work would have been astronomical, and though the choice of certain images like palm trees and pomegranates are further allusions to the Temple of Israel, their design reveals the influence of contemporary Sassanid art. Byzantium's Persian neighbour was an exporter of artistic goods, and Anitsia's husband was a general on the Eastern Front who may well have brought back designs which influenced her tastes. As you can see, the site of the church itself is not much of a tourist attraction, and this fence keeps you away from the substructure. But lying around outside, you will find pieces from the church which have been left to become makeshift park benches for the locals. 
This will give you some idea of the monumental size of the church, and you could always combine your visit with a stop at the nearby aqueduct of Valence. To see examples of the glorious decoration, head instead to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. One piece of the peacock carving is currently sitting in the gardens, while the other can be found in the Istanbul Through the Ages section of the museum. There you will also see an example of the beautifully carved capitals and one of the decorated columns, with a bit of colour still visible, which is very rare. You can also take a look at some of the smaller finds from the site. In order to see other pieces from St. Polyuctus, you will have to travel further afield. The Venetians bankrolled the Fourth Crusade and took home several pieces of the church as trophies. The two finest examples are the so-called Pilastri Acritani, beautifully carved columns which stand near the southwest corner of the Basilica of San Marco. More stolen capitals are nearby if you know where to look. Other pieces can be found as far afield as Barcelona, Vienna, and Aquileia. If you're exploring Istanbul in detail, though, head to the Zeyrek Mosque, formerly the church of the Pantokrator, built by the Komnenos family. They also reused pieces of Polyuctus in their church, and to demonstrate the universal appeal of Anitsia's artisans, these pieces survived the conversion of the building into a mosque. They were actually reworked into the minbar, or pulpit, of the rebranded Zarek Mosque. If you'd like more detailed information about the Church of St. Polyuctus, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today, and there you'll find most of the still images and sketches used in these videos. If you'd like to see videos about the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus, then follow these links. <laughs>